This Week in Radio Tech. Episode 148 is brought to you by the TELUS IQ6 talk show system. Six lines, POTS or ISDN, and two advanced TELUS hybrids for clear caller audio and easy conferencing. On the web at telos-systems.com. And now, our feature presentation. Twerd. AM stations on the FM dial and thousands of FM applications still tied up at the FCC in Washington on Twerd. All right, calm down. He says that to everyone. This calls for immediate discussion. What's up? Yeah. All your days are belong to us. Yeah. From his palatial office of important business. Or in a choice hotel in a distant land. This is Kirk Harnack. Chris Tobin joins me to chat with engineer and consultant Mark Humphrey. Mark discusses FM translators. You're dialed in to This Week in Radio Tech. It's time for This Week in Radio Tech. Hi there, I'm Kirk Harnack. Yes, I'm stuck in this radio engineering world. Why? Because I I loved radio when I was like in my teens. And I got a job in radio and decided I wasn't any good as a disc jockey. And so I got into radio engineering. And now, what, 35 years later, here we are talking about it on the internet that didn't even exist back then you've tuned into the show where we talk about audio engineering at least as it applies to radio stations and media distribution uh we talk about rf engineering antennas receiving sometimes we talk about interesting propagation modes of rf and hey we've even touched on the subject of moon bounce how about that so if you're a propeller head radio geek you like audio you like rf You've tuned into the right show. Our program is brought to you by uh, the folks who are also my employer. Thank goodness they sponsored the show. The folks at Telos, the Telos Alliance, which is Telos, Omnia, and Axia. Let me introduce you to uh, a co-host. We have one co-host on the show and a very special guest. First of all, let's bring in. He's live at the GFQ studios in person, so no internet problems for him today. It's Chris Tobin, the best dressed engineer in radio. Hey, Chris. Hi, Kirk. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's a fun time. We're doing some fun stuff here at GFQ, and uh, I thought I'd stop by and say hi and see what's happening. And uh, you know, it's just the way it goes. And I'm with the Music Cam USA folks, and uh, we do IP codecs, audio and video as well. And I've been doing radio for oh gosh, uh, yeah, I guess twenty or thirty years. And uh, it's just one of those things you just enjoy doing. Yeah, you can do TV as well, but it's not the same. I like the, uh, the the video missing. The, the radio has the no video part. That's really good. But oh, wait a minute. We're in a multimedia world. Never mind. I guess we can't <laughs> do that right. anymore. <laughs> here, so here we are on TV talking about radio, right? And I, I don't know what that what that means. Uh, and it's the also world interesting. has changed. It, it's also interesting, Chris, that you head up a company here in the U.S. that does specializes in coded audio. Used to be over ISDN, Switch 56, nailed up data circuits. Now over IP because that's the kind of circuit that is conveniently available. So you do that, and the company that I work for does something very similar. We do, you know, ISDN and IP uh, uh, audio. I guess one difference is you guys at Music Cam also have some video products, yeah? Yes, yes, we do uh, video as well. So it's video over IP, or yeah, video over IP is the way to put it. Uh, it's actually pretty wild, the stuff that's going on, what we're doing tonight and what we do on Twirt. I mean, yes, it's TV, it's video, IP TV, whatever, whatever you like to call it. But the radio element that we do is now conveyed in, in not only audio, but visual. So we can show things, talk about it. So it's evolution. It's an evolutionary technology we're, you know, we're doing. And those of us that uh, refuse to do any video at our radio stations, shame on you. <laughs> you know, I, I do wonder... What is the next transport technology? Will IP, kind of as we know it now, or as a backward compatible mode, still be around in a few years from now? In 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 ten years, twenty years? What what? Or is this the foundation that everything else will grow on for decades and decades and decades to come? I'm I'm going to venture a guess. This is the foundation, just as we had back in the early days when Switch Fifty Six was coming out, and that was the you know the evolutionary move of switched circuits out of the POTS world. You know the plain old telephone service, which was switched, and um, and now you know what do you call it? The Switch Fifty Six came out, ISDN, T ones, and the uh, all the optical stuff, all all on TDMs, ATM frames, the whole bit. Now I think IP is that new new start. We we now know what we want. We know how we'd like to have it from the days of switched circuits. Now we're going to move to the next level of uh, packet switched, and how do we achieve that same quality of service? or uh, I should say quality of experience, which is I think is the new phrase now, with IP. And that's where oh, the challenge is. Mm-hmm. Now, there's a word I had, a phrase I hadn't heard, quality of experience. Quality, quality of experience. Of if you work yeah. with the telecom folks, oh, I'm sorry, they're not telecoms, they're uh, communication <laughs> companies. Uh, <Yeah>. if, you, 
if you're dealing with those folks, uh, Qualcomm included, it's a quality of experience now. It's, it's not service, experience. So uh, since we're in a visual world, you can you know read between the lines if they get really out of control with the experience. Well, hey, I, I didn't mean to leave them out. We do have a guest, and that's uh, that's what I, I really want to get to is our guest. Uh, talk about a quality of experience. I've known this guy for, I don't know, 10 years or so. Uh, met uh, Mark Humphrey in, I believe it was Philadelphia. I believe that's, uh, Mark, I hope that's right. That's where you live. Let's bring him in. Mark Humphrey, who is uh, an ex- extraordinary uh, engineer uh, uh, in, in, in radio. Mark, you there? Yes, yes. Thank ah, you. Good. Uh, pleasure good. to be here with uh, with you and Chris tonight. This is you, uh, you, quite an experience. Uh, you, you, are, you are in, I'm, I'm sorry, Mark, I didn't mean to interrupt you. You are in, in the Philly area, right? Yes, uh, okay. about 25 miles west of Philadelphia near Exton, Pennsylvania. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, so, hey, uh, when you and I met, it seems like you were uh, engineering for the Radio 1 facility in, in the Philly area, and, um, and not too long after that, you hung out your own shingle, and you've been doing... Uh, uh, contract engineering and consulting work ever since. Tell us about about what you're doing. What's your uh, what's your radio yeah. experience and and why the heck do you like this stuff? Oh, I've been doing this since high school. I think uh, I got uh, kind of hooked on radio in fourth grade. Mrs. Stafford's fourth grade class. We took a field <laughs> trip to uh, Channel Three WSYR in Syracuse. It was actually TV AM and FM, and that was my first exposure to uh, a broadcast facility. And and I guess uh, I got bit back then. And uh, later on in school, we we put an FM on the air at, at my high school WBXL, which is still on in Baldwinsville, New York. And then uh, after college. Uh, Went on to Syracuse University, uh, was chief of WAER for a few years, and then uh, Rochester, New York. Moved here in 1984 and uh, worked for Temple University, WRTI, and then uh, 92, 10 years ago, or 20, 20, you know, 20 years ago, <laughs> uh, went to work for WPLY, which was purchased by Radio One in, uh, in the year 2000. And since 2005, I've been a freelancer doing consulting work, contract engineering, and so forth. One of the things, Mark, that you wanted to, to chat about, and I, it's a very interesting subject right now, it's very timely. Uh, a, few, a couple of weeks ago, um, the FCC, the uh, Federal Communications Commission, in case you're outside the U.S., the FCC here in the U.S. acted on, um, on some issues surrounding uh, LPFM, low-power FM, and FM translators. And there's a component in there, especially as it relates to AM stations. Now, now Mark, um, none of my AM stations that I'm part owner of, and I guess at the moment it's uh, just one, uh, but uh, I, don't, I don't have any experience about this idea of an AM station being retransmitted on an FM translator. And so, uh, hey, tell you what, for the benefit of, um, of those who aren't in the radio business, uh, who are listening or watching this podcast, let's give a little pa- one-paragraph overview of what is an FM translator and why the heck was it invented and you know, how much power are these things. And then we'll get into this notion of putting an AM station on an FM translator. Why would you do that? So tell us about FM translators and their genesis. Yeah, if it'll be a little challenging to do it in one paragraph. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, take your time um, then. We got an hour. <laughs> the uh, as I understand it, the way this whole translator thing got started was back in the early days of television, where uh, rural communities out west had trouble getting good reception from places like Denver, Salt Lake, whatever, and uh, these these little communities in the mountains initially started with passive repeaters. They would, they would put an antenna on a hilltop and try to run a piece of cable to another antenna looking into the valley oh. and get kind of a better picture, but it didn't work very well because there was no amplification. You had to have a very short path from this passive repeater to the population. Mm-hmm. And then somebody had the idea, why don't we... Put, a, put an amplifier and retransmit on a different channel. And we'll pick a channel that's blank and, you know, run 10 watts, whatever. And that's how TV translators were born, except the FCC didn't know about this. And then, of course, the <laughs> <Really>? commission. <laughs> oh my well, God. you know, this was out west where these little towns, I figured the FCC 
never comes to visit. So we can you know, get and, by and, with this and for let a me, while. Let me tell you, um, you know, east of the Mississippi, it doesn't seem that there there has been just a huge need for TV translators, and and probably not a need for FM translators to service a community. But uh, and and I've always been an east of the Mississippi guy most of my life. But some years ago, I got to go out to uh, Laramie, Wyoming, to look at buying an FM uh, construction permit for Laramie. And uh, got there and realized that Laramie uh, at the time I, I didn't have a TV station, just had a couple of FM stations, and yet a lot of stations from uh, I want to say from Denver, but I, I, I maybe that's too far away. But uh, uh, other out of market stations came in, and there were active translators on a mountaintop uh, picking up these uh, TV and FM stations and then translating them down into the wherever the 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 valley that that Laramie, Wyoming was in. And then, you know, the light really turned on in my head. Oh, this is why we have translators. And then it also occurs to me when I was a little boy, I, li I did live in Kansas, and there were plenty of translators for the TV stations in Kansas. Not that there were any mountains hiding a a, a community, but it was just such a long distance, you know, from uh, you know, from Wichita to uh, uh, the other communities that were out far farther in the western part of the state. So at the top of the hour, the TV stations would you know throw up a slide with the entire state of Kansas shown. And uh, I remember KAKE TV would say, with, which called their viewing area Cake Land. Uh, they would say, "These are the Cake Land translator stations of Channel 10." And they would show all the little, you know, all the call letters of all the translators in every little podunk town and farming community across Kansas. So. Yeah, okay, this is making sense now as to why we have a need for translators, perhaps started in the West when towns are behind mountains, but then stations also want to fill in and maybe even expand their coverage area. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, to jump in there, but this is all yeah. making sense now. Yeah, it, it, that, that's how the whole thing got started, back, back in the early days of television. In fact, here in Pennsylvania, there are uh, a few translators up uh, in the Poconos and Schuylkill County, which is uh, you know, maybe 50 miles northwest of here, where uh, they've been operating for years. So that was the birth of translators. The FCC saw a legitimate need, and they created a, uh, a provision for TV. And then it was just a matter of time before somebody took probably a Channel 6 television translator and tweaked it a little bit and then started bringing in distant FM. Mm -hmm. And I think it was around 1970 that the FCC found out about that and then decided, well, you know, FM needs the same kind of help reaching these pockets of population, you know, in isolated areas. So they created the, the uh, Part 74 section uh, and legalized FM translators. And then for many years, uh, not much happened. I mean, the, one of the problems, the power restrictions for FM were very severe. They allowed, they regulated by uh, transmitter output power. West of mm. the Mississippi, you could have 10 watts transmitter output, TPO. East of the Mississippi, one watt. Oh, wow. And yeah, any kind of antenna you wanted to use, uh, but, you know, there are some limits on how much gain you can get without spending a fortune. And uh, it was not until the 80s that they relaxed those restrictions and they adopted the current limits, which are based strictly on effective rated power, ERP. Hey, hey now, here's a, Mark, here's yeah. a question for you. Um, it's what part of the rules am I recalling where, let's say I own an FM station. Um, I thought there were little or no circumstance where I could also own a translator. The translator had to be owned by somebody else, technically. And, and yeah. in that case, the, the purpose of the translator was to, hey, we don't have any FM service in our town, but I've got a few bucks. I want to put up an antenna, pick up a station from a distant city, and retransmit it at one watt. And, hey, I'm even allowed maybe one minute an hour to put in a local commercial that I can sell to help defray the cost of me running this translator as, as a service. Am I remembering that right? Was that the rule at right. one point? That was the rule. Uh, if you were the licensee of the primary FM station, and it was a commercial station. Mm -hmm. The translator had to serve an area within your primary service area. So you were allowed to own a fill-in translator within your normal 
you know, either 60 dBU or, or 54 dBU if it was a commercial class B. But if, if you were going to be bringing in a distant commercial station, you were not supposed to have any financial connection with the licensee. In other mm. words, if, suppose you like classical music and uh, there was a station, you know, 75 miles away playing classical, you could form a little group and you could sponsor the translator and you could be a separate entity from the, the primary licensee. But non-commercial, they always made an exception. You were allowed uh, as a non-commercial licensee to have non-fill-ins that served areas outside uh, the, the 60 dBU. When I went to work for Temple University, uh, WRTI in Philadelphia back in the 80s, uh, I proposed to the to the school. I said, "We're running a unique format here, which at the time was all jazz, mm -hmm. and uh, there were some communities, you know, forty, fifty miles away from from Philadelphia, notably Reading and Allentown, that were fairly large markets." And I said, "Why don't we put some translators in in those towns, expand our coverage area, and the cost of doing this is minimal, and it will help bring in some." you know, some contributors, some members, and it t turned out to be very successful. And then uh, over the years, we did several more. So that's something that kind of got going in the mid-'80s. There, there was a big increase in translator applications, and then the FCC revised the rules. And then in the 90s, a little bit of growth, but it was not until 2003 when they opened this most recent filing window we just saw a whole pile of applications come in, more than the commission ever expected. Thirteen mm. over over thirteen thousand applications filed in a single window. Gee. Uh, okay. In fact, the commission had to extend the window a few days because I don't think uh, CDBS could handle the load. <laughs> so they, you know, it was uh, one reason that this this window attracted so much interest was online filing used to be you had to file on paper. You had yeah. to draft everything, go to the Xerox machine, you know, make copies, send them to the commission. With online filing, you, know, you can almost write a script to do it automatically. And I think that's what some of the applicants did. But uh, that gets us up to 2003. Meanwhile, let's talk about the AM side of things. For, for quite a while... Uh, the commission or, or various parties had proposed allowing AM stations to be carried on FM translators uh, as a way to give AMs better quality coverage and give uh, daytimers full time service and so forth. And um, in fact, there was a petition filed, I think, back if I check my notes here, um, it, it may have been back in uh, like 1981. And for many years, the, the NAB opposed this, and the FCC turned down these requests. There were some very limited exceptions. And in fact, one of them, I think, is near where you live, uh, Kirk, there in Nashville, and I think it was WAMB. Are they 1160? Yes, that does ring a bell. Um, I think, but this was some years ago, 10 years or so yeah. ago? This was may have actually been uh, almost twenty years ago. Oh, okay. Uh, WAMB, okay. I think, was subject to to some interference from Cuba, uh, uh -huh. and this was in connection with some of uh, some of the efforts we were doing with Radio Marti, and 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 Cuba was trying to retaliate by jamming or you know disregarding some of the agreements regarding interference to American broadcasters. So. WAMB had a special waiver to run a translator at night, and uh, I think some stations in Alaska operated under waivers, but it was not until just a few years ago that the NAB had a change of opinion, and they looked at what was happening with low-power FM, and they, you know, they, they saw all of these little holes in the FM band, FM spectrum, that were being starting to fill up, you know, with, with low-power FM and so forth. And they said, you know, F AM is in trouble. Uh, it, it's probably time to change our stance on this and, 
And then the NAB filed a rulemaking, and this was back uh, in July of 2006. And the commission finally approved it in 2009, but in the meantime started to allow more waivers. And uh, now it's completely legal if an AM broadcaster wants to simulcast on FM and they can find a license for sale because mm -hmm. they, they can't apply until the next window. So you have to find a, a, you know, an, a, an authorization, either a license or a construction permit, and purchase it or have it transferred from another party before you can get in the game. So that, that's kind of where we stand with the state of AM translators right now. I'm co-owner of an AM station, uh, WCJW, in upstate New York. It's about halfway between Buffalo and Rochester and a little to the south. A strict daytimer. We're on 1140. We get nothing at night because uh -huh. w WRVA in Richmond, uh, also on 1140, has protected Skywave service in that part of New York State. So we don't even get one watt. Yeah. And, uh, we we <clears throat> jumped on this as soon as we saw the NAB petition for rulemaking. And then we heard about some translator licenses that were up for sale. And we decided to take a chance and buy a license and request an STA. And fortunately, the commission decided to go ahead and, and approve this on a full-time basis. And that was our first translator, and now we have three more on the air, and we just bought a, a fifth license. And I'll tell you, it's, it's been a, a real big boost to our station and the community we serve. Hey, and, you know, in a few minutes, I, I, I do want to chat about um, uh, the religious uh, broadcasters who have, got, have gotten translators and, and uh, the, the way some folks feel about that. Of course, it's you know, kind of first come, first serve. But I want to ask you about, I thought some years ago, uh, maybe around, uh, around 1999, 2000, 2001, it seems like I was hearing a lot about um, AM stations getting uh, an FM translator in Alaska. And um, uh, it seems like Alaska was the maybe the proving ground or the first place where stations were proving, yeah, we really need to do this. <laughs> and maybe I'm remembering this wrong, but then and then not long after that, it seems like a, a station in Jackson, Mississippi, also got this. An AM station got an FM translator. Do you do you remember about this about uh, Alaska I, being an, an early ground? I for do this? remember uh, Alaska, uh, and that goes back a while. Uh, that oh, may have oh. been in the 90s. I, I think the rationale, Alaska, of course, you have a lot of wide open spaces where, you know, AM traditionally is was the way to serve, you know, large rural areas. But uh, due to problems with propagation and so forth, these little pockets of population, you know, they, they do better with just the low power FM signal simulcasting the AM. So, mm. Uh, and, and, and the broadcasters there couldn't really justify building of a Class A or a Class C or something that was going to take a lot of power and require big equipment. So the translator made more sense, 10 watts, 50 watts, whatever, to fill in some of these little villages. But the, it, it, proved, it proved to be successful in Alaska, and, and fortunately the NAB saw that and then initiated this rulemaking in 2006 – and now that that whole provision has been extended throughout the country. You are listening to or watching uh, This Week in Radio Tech. I'm your host, Kirk Harnack. We're glad you're along with us. Our co-host um, is Chris Tobin. He happens to be at the, at the mothership at the GFQ Studios in Queens, New York. And our guest this week is Mark Humphrey, who is a contract uh, engineer and a consultant in the radio, in the radio business. And uh, I've known Mark for, I guess, almost 10 years now. And I'm always impressed with Mark's knowledge and uh, uh, accuracy in, uh, in, in you know, describing the, a situation, whether it's a political or, or you know, a filing, an FCC kind of issue, or whether it's, uh, it's an, a, a technical issue with broadcasting. Also, I'm going to ask Mark uh, after after the break here. Uh, we're going to talk more about translators, low power FMs, and then I want to ask Mark a little bit about uh, uh, broadcasting uh, as they do it in a couple other countries. That I know Mark is quite a traveler, and so I want to ask about that. Our show is brought to you by uh, the folks who happen to be my employer, the Telos Alliance, and uh, I brought something along for the show here uh, to uh, to little show and tell. Um, showed this last week. This is uh, the Telos, um, if I can show it here, this is the Telos VSET 6. It's a six-line uh, telephone talk show system controller. 
And the cool thing about this new product that we're now shipping, the VSAT 6, is that it's, uh, well, it's, it's Ethernet-based, so the, the only connection to it is Ethernet. It plugs into an Ethernet switch, or in this case, I've got it plugged directly in the phone system. You don't actually have to have an Ethernet switch if you just have one of these hooked up. It's got a beautiful color display on it, uh, so you can see the, the menu items, and you can also see the, the phone lines uh, as, they're, as they're on there. You can see which lines are active and the, if they're on hold or ringing in, that kind of thing. What's interesting from an engineering perspective is this phone... This phone is uh, actually a little Linux computer. It's, it's, a, it's running Linux in it. It boots up in about um, 45 seconds or so when you, when you plug it in. And uh, it's, so it's, it's a computer that just looks like a phone, so it's comfortable to, uh, to use. You can use this, um, this controller to uh, pick up and answer and screen uh, telephone calls for a talk show. Or you can also use it as a controller to actually assign the calls to go on the air. And uh, you can attach up to, um, I think, up to about eight of these to uh, one of our phone systems. Now, I want to bring out the phone system. Last week, we showed, um, we showed a phone system called... The, I'm, I'm going to unplug this from the, uh, from the power because I want to turn around and, and show you the, uh, the back side of it. Last week... We showed you a phone system called the HX6, and we told you it's just about to start shipping from Telos. Uh, and it's usable by any broadcaster, whether or not you have uh, uh, Axia's Livewire Studios or not. Um, th this product, the IQ6, is really just about identical to the HX6 we looked at last week. It has six phone lines. They can be POTS or ISDN. Inside, it has two telephone hybrids, so you can uh, properly conference two calls together, have a conversation that way. You can button mash uh, more callers into a hybrid, but you can have two, two proper hybrids in there. But check, check this out. I want to show you the back side of this now. There's not much there on the back side. It's mostly blank panel. You say, well, Kirk, how do you use this thing? Well, first I'll show you. There's, there are the POTS connections. You can also get an ISDN card that goes in here that accepts three ISDN BRI lines, and that will give you six phone lines. The only other connection on the back, though, okay, there's the power connector right there. It does work all around the world, 90 volts up to 250 volts or so. And then there's a live wire Ethernet connector right there. And look, that's all. So how do you get the audio uh, from the caller out to your console? Live wire. How do you get audio from uh, your console to the caller? That would be Livewire. How do you get um, program on hold? So when you put a caller on hold, they, they hear the radio show. That would be Livewire. How do you uh, control, turn, you, know, you know, tell this thing which call to put on the air? Well, that's actually technically not Livewire, but it is Ethernet. It's the same jack. Uh, you, how do you upload new software? Mm, same thing right there. You get the idea? All of this is done in the Ethernet domain, and that actually makes this phone system less expensive for Telos to manufacture. So the, uh, the phone system we looked at last week, the HX6, that phone system is just a little under $3,000 for the, for the six-line phone system. This phone system is just a little bit over $2,000. I think there's about a seven or $800 difference in the list price of these two products. And the savings comes in all the XLR, the balance connections, uh, the possibility of AES and all, and, and all that, the GPIOs that are not on here. Why? Because if you've got Axia Livewire, You've got all that stuff already, and you don't need to duplicate it. So check it out on our website at telos-systems.com. And look up this little baby. It's called the IQ6. We actually developed this to go with the Telos IQ, uh, excuse me, the Axia IQ audio console. And it's a Telos branded product that works specifically with the IQ console. It'll work with our other consoles uh, in from Axia as well. And I wanted to show that to you. The VSET 6 and the, uh, the IQ6 six-line phone system. Really quite cool. All right, our show's obviously being brought to you by uh, the folks at Telos Systems on the web at telos-systems.com. This is This Week in Radio Tech, uh, along with me, Kirk Harnack. Chris Tobin is in studio in Queens, New York, and Mark Humphrey is talking to us from uh, his engineering lair near, uh, it was, is it Exton, Pennsylvania? Is that where you are? Yes, close right. to Exton, yes. Hey, uh, we've kind of, I've kind of been monopolizing the conversation here. And I know Chris Tobin, he's such a gentleman. He's happy just to sit back and drink a glass of wine and listen. Chris, have you got any comments or, or questions uh, as we've moved along here on the subject of uh, translators? 
Well, I'm curious. Uh, do you think with this new ruling or the proposed uh, ruling that this would help AM broadcasters to sort of, um, you know, attract audience back to them or find new ways of introducing product or I should say product uh, programming to folks? Because you said you mentioned earlier that it, you know it's come a time that AM is going to have to think about the future and where things are going. I was just curious because translators when I worked in Connecticut. Uh, years ago, one of the FM stations there had a translator to fill in their coverage because of geography. And it was interesting because, you know, they really didn't promote it, say too much about it. And it was just an interesting thing to watch, except for the zone of interference when you have to listen, uh, traveling between the primary signal and then the, the translator. Just curious where your thoughts are on that as far as the AM and, you know, what what people, what options they could do. Sure, sure. Uh you know, I've worked with with a few of my my clients on uh, establishing translators, uh, and again, I'm co-owner of a station that has now four of them on the air. Give you an example: uh, WCJW is running uh, high school sports tonight. We're running a basketball game. Uh, this is something we could never do as a daytimer because with a strict sunrise to sunset schedule, uh, without even one watt at night. It just, you know, wasn't going to work. And now we have 24-hour FM service. Plus, we're able to provide really the first good FM service to our community of license, which is Warsaw, New York. Uh, Warsaw is in a pretty deep valley. It's about 450 feet below average terrain. It's about 40 miles from Rochester, about 40 miles from Buffalo. And prior to putting our translator on the air, people that wanted to listen to FM were generally trying to pick up signals from those cities over what was nothing close to a line of sight path. Now there is a class B a license to our county, Wyoming County, New York, which uh, has always been kind of a rim shotter to Buffalo and it's presently owned by Intercom. They, they, they now use it to simulcast their news and talk AM, WBEN. So, in effect, it's kind of acting as a high-power FM translator, even though it's licensed as a Class B. But uh, other than that station, people in Warsaw really couldn't get very good FM reception. None of the Rochester or Buffalo FM stations ever saw a need to put a translator in Warsaw. It just didn't make sense economically because they did not sell in our community. And so it really wasn't going to bring in much significant revenue. But uh, since we put this on, we've had a great response. And then, you know, that encouraged us to, to build a few more. And uh, what we found is that people use the FM as their primary service now, but the AM is still useful as a secondary service in areas that the FMs don't cover. So it's kind of a reverse role from what the FCC officially says. Uh, they consider translators secondary, they consider the AM primary, but that's really just the opposite of how uh, the listeners in our area have responded. So, uh, And it's also, of course, expanded the amount of time we can sell advertising. We have more avails now we can sell. We can broadcast in stereo. We you know, have, have added a lot of uh, new programming and uh, move the farm show to five in the morning when the farmers get up. Mm. Uh, we don't ha we don't have to run it at noon anymore. It used to be on in the middle of the day, and of course at that time most of the farmers are out on the field. So we can put our programs where the audience, uh, where it's most convenient for uh, you know different segments of the audience to listen. Mark, I've got a question about um, translators and EAS, and I, I'm, I'm yep. guessing that if a translator is inside an FM station's uh, you know, normal coverage area, well, then uh, you're going to be, it, it's, it's fine to, to retransmit the EAS from the originating station. How, how are translators that are outside of the station's normal coverage area, what do they have to do about EAS, if anything? Uh, legally, the, as long as you simulcast the primary station, you're in compliance. So mm -hmm. if, it's a, if it's a translator as opposed to a separate full-service license, as long as you carry the primary station's programming, I believe uh, you're in compliance with EAS. And that's what we do. 
then again, all of our translators are within the two millivolt contour of the AM station. That's part of the rule. Uh, AM stations are only allowed to serve within the two millivolt contour of the daytime facility mm -hmm. or a 25 mile radius, whichever is less. Under mm. the current wow. Rule. So, okay. So. Now, help me understand something else about translators. Um, seems like some years ago, I was approached by a religious organization who wanted to establish or purchase or, or apply for translators. And they currently, they, they didn't have a main licensed uh, FM station at that time. And they were under the impression, I guess it was true, that they had to have a main station, an actual licensed full power FM station, and then they could have translators outside their areas. Is that how that works? Uh, if they wanted to originate programming, yes. Uh, mm. If they wanted to pick up a different station and just import it into their community, um, as long as they had you know, a letter of agreement with the primary, yeah. then somebody else could own the primary. But if they wanted to do local origination, yes, they, they would need um, a primary station of their own to feed but the that, Tell me about, about uh, it seems like some years ago I was hearing a lot of this word, a satellator. As opposed yeah. to a translator. What's a satellator? Satellator is the term for a, <laughs> a satellite-fed translator. Uh, okay, so and, it's not fed over the air by picking up a, an FM station. Right. It's, okay. it's either fed by satellite. That, that's usually how these national networks do it. But it mm -hmm. could be fed by some other alternate means of delivery. It could be IP these days. Yeah. And a lot of those got going, I think, back in the late 80s, early 90s, um, Moody out of Chicago uh, pushed for those, and the rationale was that they felt a need to provide their unique programming to communities that that didn't get it locally, and it and it made sense to uh, to you know to run these these uh, satellite fed translators. Of course, uh, now we're you know years later, the the FM band is getting more and more crowded, and and so satellites. Uh, finding the opportunities to put those on are limited. Uh, and, and there are some restrictions that the FCC put in place as to how far away you can feed these. And uh, I would have to pull out my rule book and, you know, to find the specifics there. But uh, uh, there are no satellites in this part of Pennsylvania. You generally find them in, in the more rural communities and, you know, out in the west and south and whatever. Now the the rules that I know there's there's often been uh, um, um, there are some broadcasters who have been very against the big religious groups you know applying for hundreds of translators and I guess making them satellites uh, across the country when when a big group uh, educational or religious or whatever applies for a bunch of translators does that in some way preclude local or regional people from doing that? How how are mutual uh, the word mutually exclusive? How are mutually exclusive applications uh, decided upon? And and if I wanted to put up a, a translator here in uh, Nashville or let's say someplace where I more likely could down the road in Shelbyville, Tennessee, uh, and I want to to apply for a, a frequency and uh, for a translator, and somebody else like Moody uh, or EMF Broadcasting uh, does the same thing, how do they decide who gets it? And do I have an advantage because I'm more local? What's the what's the deal there? You know, this this I'm glad you brought that up, Kirk, because uh, I will I will show Exhibit A here if if we can uh, okay. get a good picture of it. it this is uh, <laughs> the latest rulemaking from the FCC, or I should say the 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 report and order. This is the fifth order on reconsideration and sixth report and order dealing with both translators and low power FM. And this is okay. something they've been struggling with for almost ten years. Mm. During the last filing window for translators, 2003, March 2003, all these you know, 13,000 plus applications were filed. And of those, they were able to grant uh, a few thousand that were consi considered singletons. There were no competing applications uh, in many of the markets uh, on these particular frequencies and they were able to sort through and say okay you you have no mutually exclusive applications we can we can grant but there are still almost uh, probably nine or ten thousand that are still tied up because of the you know the situation that you just described where mm. there may have been a, uh, a 
group from afar that filed, and maybe a local applicant that wants the same channel, and so it's mutually exclusive. And the audio division just released this big document, 110 pages, and I've started to get through it. <laughs> and I'll try to summarize it the best I can here. <laughs> wow. Well, the problem is they, they, the commission never expected the mass filing. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, the low-power FM proponents cried foul. They said, wait a minute. If all these translators are granted on the remaining open channels, especially in, in large markets, we're never going to have a chance to do any more low-power FM. Yeah. So the commission tried to strike a balance. Initially, they proposed cutting off the pending applications at 10%. 10 per applicant. So, uh, a, lot, and a lot of these groups were already granted, granted uh, construction permits, and they've already built translators and sold them. So, the mm -hmm. commission said, okay, you guys did pretty well, but we're just going to say 10 more, and that's it. And, of course, they filed petitions for reconsideration. And then the cap was lifted to 50 with one in each of the 150 largest markets where the commission felt that there was not enough opportunity for low power FM. And, uh, and then there were still some negotiations that took place. And now with this most recent document, they, they've revised the plan once again, and they're hoping that this is going to be it. And the way it's going to work, if I can summarize, each applicant will get to keep up to 70 applications of which 50 can be in what they call the Appendix A markets. Mm. And you have to refer to Appendix A of the previous uh, report and order where they identified these markets, generally the top 150 Arbitron markets, where they feel they need to preserve low-power FM opportunities. So you'll be allowed now to, to, to retain up to three applications in each of those markets with a lot of conditions. You still have to show that there are some LPFM openings. There, there's a grid that they've defined, and uh, without getting into a lot of detail, um, you know, there'll be a lot of studies that will need to be done in the next couple of months. These big uh, groups that have filed are going to have to kind of pare down the ones they want to keep. And, uh, and then the commission's going to try to sort everything out. Now, if these are commercial translator applications and they're still mutually exclusive, they're going to have to go to an auction unless, you know, the, the groups have them withdrawn and, and they get them down to singletons. And then once all of this, L this translator uh, MX business is, is resolved, maybe by October of next year, There'll be an LPFM filing window, and all these low-power FM groups will be able to submit applications. Once that's all sorted out, and now we're probably talking now, you know, two or three more years, then they may open another translator filing window. But I don't see that happening for a while. And uh, right now, though, if if you're an AM or an FM or any any licensee, and you want a translator. You cannot file for a new one. You have to find one that's for sale or available, make a deal, and uh, you are allowed some limited moves. And uh, hopefully you can make it work in your situation. You, you know, a couple times we've mentioned people buying translators. Does it, can you buy and sell a translator just as you would uh, a regular radio station with its license? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, there are brokers that, that deal in, in translators as well as full-service licenses, and um, a lot of licensees uh, deal direct. I mean, they find a, a local group that perhaps has translators that duplicate uh, existing service, and the, the current owner says, hey, I don't need that anymore, and they're willing to make a deal. And uh, so it's... There are a lot of people looking for them that can't find them. I mean, it's it's going to take a while to sort this out. But um, in in the more rural areas, I think you'd be more successful finding uh, licenses and construction permits for sale. Now, the whole thing has changed a little bit, though, because the commission 
has decided to allow commercial FM stations to rebroadcast HD subchannels on an mm -hmm. analog translator. If you're an FM station and you're running digital and you have an HD2 or HD3, you can actually buy a translator and rebroadcast the programming from that secondary HD service onto an analog FM signal on a different frequency. And this is going on in places like Atlanta and uh, even Ithaca, New York. In fact, in Ithaca, I think that was the case that established the precedent that, that opened this whole thing up. And, uh, you know that actually, the, what you mentioned there about uh, a, a, an FM station can get a translator and retransmit their HD two, thereby perhaps opening up that programming to more listeners. Those people who don't have HD receivers, uh, th that brings up an interesting question. Um, I know in American Samoa, um, w where I have some stations, we wanted to get a translator, and we wanted to fit because of terrain. It was difficult to feed the, to the translator by other means. We wanted to feed that translator, but not by HD2, because then we'd have to be paying for the HD technology, and that's a, not, an in, not a trivial cost at all. We wanted to feed it using FM Extra technology, which is far less expensive, although not as widely deployed. And the FCC would not allow that. You could, you could retransmit your HD2, but you could not retransmit a subcarrier done with a digital technology like FM Extra. And that just chapped me really badly. What difference does it make the technology that I use on my own FM signal to get a signal to the translator that I own? Do you have an opinion right. about that? I do. <laughs> okay. It, Tell me. Technically, technically, it makes no sense. Legally, here's the problem. HD radio is intended to reach the general public. FM Extra, at this stage of the game, uh, is considered a subcarrier. It's, uh, yeah. you know, to use the old jargon, SCA, Subsidiary Communications Authorization, which is not directed to the general public in the mind of the FCC. It's, it's, it's intended as a special service. And, of course, you know, the history of of SCA, initially a lot of stations ran music, background music or ethnic sure. programming. But all of these uh, programs are directed towards uh, various you know, niche groups that, that really weren't the public at large. And apparently uh, the commission still regards FM Extra as that type of service. Therefore, it's ineligible to be the primary feed to a translator. So it's, it's just a legal distinction. And... Uh, uh, nobody has been able to challenge this, you know, this this FCC uh, distinction. Yeah, well, and, and it turns out that in our case, in American Samoa, with low budgets, uh, honestly, we could write a check for FM Extra technology. We are not in a position to write a check for HD technology. And so, therefore, no translator, no feed, no extra service to the public. That's, 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 the the that's the bottom line. So, yeah. Yeah, you can, uh, you're, you're in a whole different world. I mean, if you're doing HD, you've got the licensing fee for Ubiquity. You've got some pretty expensive equipment. Uh, although I know of some small market broadcasters who have made that investment because they want to offer you know, more services, more formats. And um, the other interesting thing, uh, translators are not counted towards ownership limits. So if ah, you're at yeah. limit or close to the limit and you've got the maximum number of FM stations in a market, you can go above and beyond that with these translators running your HD channels. So it's kind of a loophole to get you around ownership limits. And if you if you put the antenna on a tall tower or a mountaintop or whatever, 250 watts if possible, You've got essentially a, a class A signal or close to it. And, and at so, least in my case, in American Samoa, that covers the whole island just fine. <laughs> except, except for some terrain difficulties, that, that covers the whole island. Wow. Um, uh, and and um, uh, now, a quick question about the FM extra technology. Um, the receivers, aren't, are the receivers available to the general public? Uh, I... I'm sure if, if uh, anybody wanted to buy one from uh, you know, the FM Extra people, I, I'm sure they'd take their money. I mean, it, yeah. 
they're not generally sold through consumer electronics uh, dealers. I mean, you're not going to find one at Best Buy or yeah, or yeah. Amazon. I, maybe Amazon. I don't know. Maybe I haven't oh. checked, but uh, that's that's part of the problem. It, it, the marketing of the equipment it, it hasn't really been presented as a consumer electronics product, right, even though right. it is. So. Right. Yeah. By the way, to, an to answer Eric Adler in the chat room, um, uh, can FM Extra fit through a composite translator? The answer is absolutely yes. It's sure. a pretty ro robust uh, signal, and it's uh, it's 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 uh, it's it's part of the FM baseband. So it's it's not like the HD carriers, which are frankly a bit fragile. I mean, if you translate them, w uh, transmit them well, uh, then they hold up over the air just fine. Um, but if you want to retransmit that, transmit them, that is some technology. Whereas FM Extra is part of the FM signal. If if you can grab the whole FM baseband and and remodulate that, you're you're probably in good shape. All right, uh, gee, uh, uh, Mark, I, I I teased everybody by saying that you've been to some other countries. I know you're particularly in in love with the the terrain and the people of of Germany. Maybe you can tell us a, an interesting thing or two about broadcasting in another country that you've been to. Well, it's a, you know, I've gone to, on vacation uh, over in Europe a few times, and if I see, you know, a tower, uh, something that's high profile, uh, especially if, if it has um, an observation deck, then it's a <laughs> tourist attraction. You see, I, I feel yeah. a little guilty when I go on vacation. I'm supposed to be having fun, not, not doing business. But what they've done in Europe is kind of clever. Yeah. Here in the U.S., aside from some of these tall buildings like uh, Empire State Building or uh, what's it now in Chicago? It used to be the Sears Tower. I forget the new name. But, uh, you know, we have a few of these buildings with observation decks that happen to also be broadcast sites. But Willis Tower. Most of That's our, it. The, the, yeah, Willis, the Willis Tower. Tower. And everybody will forever call it the Sears Tower. I mean, who can remember the yeah, Willis Tower? Exactly. Uh, of course, in Toronto, there's the CN Tower, which uh, is mainly a broadcast tower, but it's also a, a public attraction. But here uh, on our, our side of the border, there just aren't that many broadcast towers that are anything but radio facilities. Whereas right. in, in Germany, they came up with this idea back in the 50s after, after the war, and they're rebuilding their broadcasting system. Uh, Germany decided to really go for FM early on, and there was a reason hmm. for that. Hmm. After the war, of course, Germany lost, and, and they lost most of the medium wave spectrum that was divvied up you know, following the war. Uh, oh, really? Uh, the, the old saying, you know, to the victor go the spoils, and yeah. uh, you know, the allies all said, well, we want all of these medium wave channels. And so Germany didn't really get much AM medium wave spectrum. Hmm. And it was decided that they would kind of you know, do this new technology that had just been invented by Major Armstrong here in the U.S. called FM. Over mm -hmm. there, they call it uh, UKV Ultra Kurzwelle, which is ultra, well, UHF in, in English, mainly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but okay. that's, the, that's a common term uh, rather than FM. But it's uh, standard frequency modulation. And uh, when they rebuilt these national networks, they decided to do multiplexed uh, transmitter sites where there would be several different channels, several programs transmitting from a common tower. And the group uh, that controlled the broadcast system in Stuttgart thought that maybe they could help finance their tower if they put an observation deck in a little restaurant or you know, a, a bar or something up at the top and uh, took a chance on this. And I think this was in the <laughs> mid-50s. They, they built a big concrete tower south of the center of town and, and uh, opened it to the public. And it turns out that they made enough money to cover the cost of the tower construction in something like two or three years. Oh, my goodness. And, uh, yeah. Oh. You know, it, with all these people that wanted to go up and get a nice view and, and spend a nice day, you know, up looking at the countryside and maybe having a little snack or whatever. And then other groups in Germany decided to do the same thing. So throughout the country, there are a number of communities uh, where they have these towers open to the public. And uh, some of them have revolving restaurants. And uh, in fact, one of them had a bungee platform. You could actually oh. go up and take a <laughs> jump. Unfortunately, uh, there was a, a, a 
fatal incident. So this was in uh, Dortmund, uh, mm -hmm. and somebody died, uh, and, and they, they said, we're not going to take any more chances, and they, they shut it down. But I think in Vienna, in Austria, they still have an active bungee platform on what they call the Donau Turm. But wow. um, so, so actually the towers over there are legitimate tourist attractions. And so I can rationalize, even though I'm on vacation, I'm going to, you know, get a nice view of the city if it's a nice day and take some pictures. And everybody else is taking pictures like out and I'm taking pictures up. You know, I'm, I'm looking up at the uh, antennas. And <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, Mark, I do the same thing. I've, I've gone to different cities with my wife, Laura. We were at the Eiffel Tower. She's looking out and down and I'm, you know, my camera's pointed up at the antennas. Same thing on the Empire State Building. It, she thinks I'm nuts. Well, I, I, was in, uh, I was in Bavaria. <laughs> uh, this, this was almost 10 years ago. Beautiful day, driving along, and there was a site that uh, I had heard about. In fact, I had seen pictures on the catalog of one of the antenna companies, Katrine, which, which owns Scala here in the U.S. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah, sure. Uh, I had seen this picture of a, of a mountaintop, uh, and the name of this is Wendelstein, and it's maybe, I don't know, 40 miles southeast of Munich. And uh, you can get up by cog railway or cable car. And I happened to pass by the, the cable car station down in the valley. So I decided to take the ride up there and uh, get up to the top. And it's still about a 300-foot climb up the trail to get to the actual summit. But finished taking my pictures, and they even have a beer garden. And I had lunch. <laughs> oh, that's great. This is great. And then, of course, they had the transmitter building down from the summit on kind of a little plateau and I and I saw the uh, one of the engineers come out and it looked like he had uh, given a tour to some high school or college students there were some younger people that uh, he let out of the building and then of course I have to think back to college I, I took German for a couple semesters and how do I ask for permission <laughs> you know and I <laughs> went up to him and my my poor German asked you know can I see the transmitter building and he was very welcoming and took me inside, gave me a nice tour. And it was quite impressive because that site not only is a, a major transmitting station for Bavaria, but it's also a monitoring point for several other transmitter sites. And they uh -huh. have a monitoring room with receivers and all sorts of, you know, remote control. And there are five FMs that were combined together into a master antenna. And I think two or three TV stations, they had, just put in digital TV, and I think they were working on digital audio from the site. It was very interesting and uh, got some nice pictures. If you do a, uh, a Google search, and it uh, starts with a W. They, they pronounce it Wendelstein, but uh, W-E-N-D-E-L, Stein. Uh, do a search, and you may come up and, and see some of the, um, some of the uh, pictures of, that other people have taken of the site. I was just looking it up myself right Ah, there it is in Wikipedia. That's the and then there's a uh, let's see there's an observatory uh entry here. Ah, wendelstein-observatorium.de. That is the uh they have an observatory that's run by one of the universities in Munich. Oh, okay, yeah. I it's see. up high enough you get above a lot of the uh the haze and the smog and uh and so forth. Oh, so, so it looks like the transmitting facility and the observatory are are right next to each other, are almost the same place, yeah. The uh, the antenna tower is is next to the observatory. The transmitter building is down a ways, uh, kind of you know part way down the mountain, and they run ah, the coax, okay. I guess, up the side. Well, it's a good thing these aren't radio telescopes they're operating; they're uh, optical telescopes. All optical, yeah, yeah. And I guess part of the sky is obscured by this darn tower that's right there. Uh, apparently, it is a very um, small, a sliver. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So that, that was a, a site I enjoyed. And, and uh, you know, there are a few others that are interesting. Uh, I visited a site in kind of the northern part of Germany called Brocken, which used to be part of East Germany. And uh, it was just across the border. It's in the Hartz Mountains. And uh, you can get there by steam train. They still have an operating, honest to goodness, steam railway. And this oh is my not. Gosh. A tourist attraction, this is a for-profit railroad company that runs narrow-gauge steam trains 
not mm-hmm. just to the mountain, but they serve that whole you know, region of Germany. And uh, so it was a nice chance to take a, an interesting train ride. Got up to the top, though, and it was all fogged in. Uh, Brocken is much like Mount Washington here in the U.S. They get fog over 200 days a year. If you're lucky, you get nice weather, you get a nice view. Unfortunately, as soon as I got there, the fog came in, and you know, I got a few lousy pictures of, of, a, of an antenna site. But what's interesting up there, because it was in the east, it was a major spy uh, facility for the, uh, you know, for the uh, communist regime that controlled that part of the country for years. And uh, huh. they have a radome, which has now been made into a museum. And you can go up into this radome where they had all of this very sensitive receiving equipment. And uh, you can see the whole history of this site. It was off limits to the public for many years. I mean, basically through the whole Cold War. And it not really opened until uh, the wall came down. But uh, very interesting place to visit if you happen to travel to that part of Germany. Mark, um, this conversation has just absolutely been delightful. I, I, I know so little, I knew so little about translators and feel like I'm a, a little bit better informed about how they work now and, and where we're headed with them and that uh, there's been some uh, report and order, uh, I guess kind of like a rulemaking, that will set some, some rules for how they're divvied up and, and applied for in, in, in the future. Boy, the FCC does have a mess on their hands with those thousands of mutually exclusive applications and, and I guess at the moment still no, uh, uh, well, maybe just now, a, a procedure to, to uh, figure those out and discern who's going get to the, get the license, yeah? Yeah, it. Uh, we'll we'll see how it goes this time. If if nobody uh, files another petition for reconsideration, that is. Uh, yeah, there's there's that possibility. We'll delay that a few. Yeah, it, it's amazing now how, what 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 it used to be. So much of FM broadcasting uh, and licensing was was um, uh, kind of on a first come first serve basis. Yeah, there were some public notices, but uh, so often uh, in in the early days here. That, now there weren't that many mutually exclusive applications. Um, but um, and there were hearings occasionally, you know, with uh, the way they divvied up stations in the '60s, '70s, and '80s. I suppose I know people have been involved with comparative hearings to see who is the best qualified candidate. Um, but uh, it, and now we have auctions on the FM band, so you know, it, 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 people complain that well, only rich people can get a radio station. Well, now with auctions, that's certainly true. Only rich people can get a radio station. Seems to me. Um, hey, is, is, is Chris Tobin there, or did we run him off or put him to sleep? Uh, neither of the two. I'm here. <laughs> okay. Hey, I, guess, I got something to show everybody. Uh, uh, Tom Ray uh, said he couldn't make it on the show tonight, but he sends his greetings. Uh-oh. Uh, there's Tom and his daughter. Okay. Uh, Sarah. Yeah. Oh, so um, that's what he does every holiday uh, at the year end. Yeah. <laughs> And the other thing I'd, I'd like to uh, mention is uh, I'm just delighted that Michael LeClaire uh, of Radio World uh, magazine, the engineering extra uh, version of Radio World, um, uh, called us up and, and asked uh, a, a few weeks ago if he could uh, uh, redo a white paper that Joe Talbot and I did at NAB. And so uh, we, uh, we did a little – actually, Michael LeClaire did most of the work, but we, uh, we, we edited this article down – um, it's, it's, it, boy, it's about a 3,500 word article. So it's pretty in depth. Uh, it's an article called, uh, it's a white, they're calling it a white paper, how I quit worrying and learned to live without pots. Now that's not pot. That's pots, plain old telephone service. And the subtitle here is case studies in VOIP telephony systems. Um, a lot of this written from, uh, Joe Talbot, who works for Telos, Joe's, uh, experience uh, on the road putting in uh, voice over IP systems from Telos in this kind of wild, wild west world of, of getting them to work with the various different VoIP providers. Uh, you know, where, where uh, uh, you know, like I always say, it's the nice thing about standards, there are so many of them. And everybody complies with most of a standard, but uh, not quite all of it. So you want to check that out. That, if, if you're a subscriber to Radio World or to their Engineering Extra, this is uh, the December 12th edition. It just came out in, uh, it just came out in my mailbox uh, yesterday. Also, Chris Alexander uh, has a good article here about uh, due diligence heads off acquisition surprises. Oh, oh, and um, one of... Uh, 
Chris Alexander's uh, compadres, a fellow named Stephen Poole. And Stephen is just down the road from me in Birmingham, Alabama. He's got a great tutorial on how to use Wireshark. You know, that's software that helps you uh, uh, an capture and analyze packets on an IT network. Um, Wireshark is something I've used a little bit, and I, I don't know how to use it well enough. But if you are a broadcast engineer, you know how the world of IT is, is coming at you, and you've been dealing probably with it for a few years. Well, uh, some problems are, are requiring you to look at the packets and see what's going on or going wrong on your IT network. And Wireshark, this is a very timely tutorial from Steve Poole, so I highly recommend that um, if you don't get Radio World's Engineering Extra, uh, these articles will probably be on the RW Online website within a, a, a couple of weeks or uh, when the next uh, issue comes out in paper mode. So I'd encourage you to check those out, if you would, at rwonline.com or just look in your mailbox. Guys, I've enjoyed this thoroughly. Uh, 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 Mark, do you have any parting thoughts for us? Anything we didn't ask you that you wanted to cover? Uh, I think we covered most of uh, most of what I wanted to say about the, the translators. Is uh, if you're an AM broadcaster um, and you want to make changes, this this might be the time to do it. If if you want to try to get a change through before the all the new applications are granted. Uh, and the LPFM window opens, I would recommend you you act now uh, because there is a, an element of first come first served here. You want to get your things in place before any more changes take place and, and then uh, you have a little more chance of protection. So that would be my thought. Gotcha. Well, good deal. Thanks for uh, bringing that word to us and making uh, and bringing this to the focus of, of our attention. These uh, these FM translators. Hey, Mark, if if an AM station owner wants to see, hey, could I get this done? Should he contact a consultant like yourself? And uh, I guess there are other consultants too who can uh, uh, make application. Sure, uh, I'd be happy uh, to to take any uh, inquiries on this. Uh, I have software and uh, have done this for. Uh, Quite a few AM broadcasters in the Northeast, in particular. So, uh, please give me a call. If uh, if folks want to reach you, uh, uh, what what's your favorite way for people to get in touch with uh, with you? They Mark? can uh, either phone or email. Uh, I do have a Google Voice line, and uh, the number is five eight five nine six nine sixty forty, and that will pretty much find me anywhere on the phone. Uh, my email is mark, spelled with uh, a K, at xy-mark.com. XY comes from my, my amateur call sign, K3XY. So uh, mark at xy-mark.com works pretty well. Or the phone, either way. Gotcha. Mark at xy-mark.com. All right, super. Hey, Chris Tobin, you made a big trip, and uh, you know we let you talk for about a minute and a half. Uh, I always feel guilty <laughs> about this. I hope That's you're having right. fun up there with uh, with Andrew and uh, and uh, what and and the and dog Spencer? Spence. Yeah, Spencer the yeah. dog. Yeah, it's, uh, not near me now, but yeah, Spencer's been running around. <laughs> yeah. No, no, Mark's okay. been talking. It's been uh, very informative. I didn't want to interrupt. It's, you know, I, what I would contribute wouldn't help any AM stations, but uh, you know, I've done a lot of FM stuff, so the AM opportunity is great. You know, yeah, from his experience to talk about, it's even better. Yeah, especially for you know a standalone AM uh, broadcasters, man, this would be, be a real boon to them to have an FM translator. Sure would. Oh yeah. All right, guys, our show's been brought to us by uh, the folks who are my employer, uh, Telos Systems, on the web at telos-systems.com. Today we showed you the VSET six, the new Ethernet uh, uh, based um, phone controller, and the IQ six six line two hybrid phone system that works with any live wire system. Uh, probably the least expensive way to put a talk show. Uh, on a live wire system is the, the IQ6. Thanks for tuning in. Coming up next week, I want to preview this for you. It's going to be a very good show. Uh, I visited a, di a, a, a differential GPS correction signal transmitting site in Mississippi. It's pretty interesting. It's a government-owned site where they transmit a signal to give you the correction factor uh, called differential GPS. There are different ways to do this, and this is one of the ways they're doing it. This base basically lets uh, sh uh, ships in the Mississippi River or in ports of call have um, uh, much better accuracy in, in, their, uh, in their navigation. Uh, also can help uh, crop dusters, for example, by putting out this differential GPS signal and giving crop dusters
testers very, very tight tolerances on where they're laying down those nasty chemicals. Well, we're going to have an explanation of this technology from a representative of Nautel. Uh, there's a lot of Nautel brand transmitters at these sites. So uh, we're going to check that out next week, December 20th. Hope you'll join us same time, same station here at gfqlive.tv at uh, 8 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time. Thanks, Mark Humphrey, for being with us. Thanks, uh, Chris Tobin, for being with us. We'll see you next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye, everybody. That's all the bandwidth we can pill for this week. Another tort has propagated, and all the transmitters and audio equipment live happily ever after, thanks to the handsome engineer and his kind, benevolent care. We'll be back next week. Lord willing, and the creek don't rise. This Week in Radio Tech. Subscribe to iTunes, and you'll never miss a show. Search for This Week in Radio Tech in the iTunes store. Soliciting is strictly encouraged. If you like today's show, tell a friend. If you didn't like it, we were never here. Kirk Harnack's wardrobe provided by the Salvation Army and the Red Cross Disaster Relief Services. Hair and makeup provided by Penny Lope Garcia Hernandez Weinberg. He's unique, wouldn't you say? I just want to get it over with. This ends this transmission. Tango, Whiskey, India, Romeo, Tango. Signing off. Okay. <laughs> 